shining star my love provides but not begin my love within the prophet soon turns strangely thin come spirit We worship and are free. Thank you so very much for joining us for worship. We are delighted that you are present with us. We appreciate your prayers, your support, your gifts, your contribution, your time, your attention. We're just glad to be your friend and have you to befriend us. This is the day that the Lord has made. In fact, it's the year that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice, and we shall be glad in it. Our worship is coming in terms of revealing the word of God, and we'll be looking at Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and we also will be looking at 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. But before I begin, I'd like to just mention that this is February, and it is uh, Black History Month. Um, Black History Month originated in 1915 when historian, author, Dr. Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. And in its beginning, it was one week of celebration. We have, of course, now progressed to a month. The whole month of February is a celebration of black history. In 1975, President Gerald Ford issue, issued a message on the observance of Black History Week, urging all Americans to recognize the important contributions made to our nation and the life and success of our nation by the culture presented by black citizens. And we have had other presidents to support this great celebration in the persons of President Carter and President Reagan. In 1986, Congress passed a public law, 989-244, which designated February 1986 as National Black or African American History Month. So with that being said, I'd like to Think on a song that's very popular among black Americans as well as white Americans and Americans of color and foreigners. This is a song entitled Amazing Grace. The first few words of that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This beloved spiritual has been performed approximately 10 million times a year. It has been estimated that that song has sung at the various events of life at least 10 million times a year. It's very, very familiar as the most recognized hymn in the English speaking world, Amazing Grace. And this song was written by a gentleman named John Newton. The story goes that Mr. Newton uh, is an Englishman who became a slave trader, whose life journey led him to write what has become a very popular hymn, The Amazing Grace song. Is really the the surface of his heart, his wounds, his regrets, his misery, his time of repentance. It seemed that he almost lost his life on a couple of occasions as he worked on the waters. One was from a very, very powerful storm. 
And I think it was there that he began to call on God and pray that the ship wouldn't break. And on another occasion, uh, John Newton became extremely ill to the point of death almost. And he called on the Lord. And it was from there about that he grabbed on to God with all his life was fully converted from the evils of the slave trade, the evils of the wildlife on the waters. And he became an ordained Anglican priest in 1764. And he wrote roughly 280 hymns with Amazing Grace being one of the most popular. And Amazing Grace is not just a song for Mr. Newton. It's really a song for all of us. We once were lost and now we're found. We once were blind, but now we see. And his contribution to society, the bitter and the sweet of it, it's truly between he and God. But I can say that whenever I hear that song, and I do hear it often, it gives me to think that sin is sin, it's horrible, it's ugly. In fact, the wages of it is death. But the great news is that anybody who sins can be forgiven if they but seek the forgiver, God himself, the giver of life. And so there we have the good and the bad of it, the black and the white of it. We're in this together. And that seems to be my sermon theme for this year. We're in this together, even though I have different topics. But the, the major theme of the matter is that we're in this together. And life has been ordained by God in whatever direction we go. He's aware. And those that suffer don't suffer without him giving strict attention to the matter. We might get by, but nobody gets away. We all have to face judgment. And it's been recorded that what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it also declares as well that where much is given, much is required. So there, that encompasses everybody. Whether you know, you perish because of a lack of knowledge. It's your responsibility and my responsibility to come to know the mighty God that created us in our mother's womb. It's our responsibility. We should want to know our history. We should want to know our immediate history and the natural, but we should also want to know our history in the spirit of God. There is a history. Our forefathers have prayed for many reasons. John Newton wasn't the only one, I'm sure, that prayed on that boat, but his history had a significant part with the African Americans. And so, the, the song connects the two. I've been in atmospheres where the song is sung and the atmosphere is predominantly white. And I've seen the reactions, the impact of the song and the vocalists and the hearers in the audience and the attention that's given. And I can't imagine what they may be thinking. We all had our private thoughts. But one thing for sure, the lyrics of that song applies to everyone. The title of our message for today is Remember He Suffered. Remember He Suffered. Our first reading is coming from Isaiah 53. And in that, it is being read from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's recorded, he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmities, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held 
him of no account. And surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, and yet we are counted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and he, Lord, has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shredders or his shearers or those that remove his hair. The lamb is completely silent. And so Christ, like under the, the character of the sheep, of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. He did not open his mouth. It's a lot to be said about remember he suffered. We all celebrate Holy Communion in our various choices of worship, in our, in our centers of religion. And when we do so, those who are Christians, we are thinking about the great and marvelous gift given by God through his son, Jesus Christ. And it seems that when he was about his father's business for three and a half years, he was wanted, dead or alive. And yet he did not let that threat stop him for pursuing the souls that needed him, the souls that needed their sight, the souls that needed to hear, the souls that needed to walk. Jesus did not deviate from the threat on his life. And the scripture says he was despised and rejected. And he tells us today, remember, he suffered. He suffered for you and he suffered for me. He suffered for the past generation and he suffered for the current and the future. He suffered. Honorably, he suffered. And one thing that stands out as I look back on and as I remember and reflect on the story of my Savior was the flogging. Flogging was such a horrible punishment. And they didn't just flog in the days of Christ. As history would have it, there was flogging in the United States. Corporal punishment no longer exists in the legal system of most developed nations of the world. The last flogging in the United States was carried out in the state of Delaware in 1952. And the practice was abolished there 20 years later in 1972. There once was flogging. Many African Americans, who was defined by different names at that time, Negroes, the negative N word, but they were flogged, many were flogged, they were whipped, some even to death. And it was considered an honorable punishment for a crime committed, defined by whomever brought about the charges. But just to know that our country once did that. I am so grateful to God that that law no longer exists. What a horrible thing to do to a human being. for whatever the price might have been. But now I just like to think that Jesus was flogged. A man who was sinless. He always did good. He was a blessing to the people. And yet, as the scripture says, 
They despised and rejected him. He was disgusting in their sight. And when we have Holy Communion and we take the bread and we take up the drink, we know that those are just natural elements. But we ask that God bless those elements, that which represents the body and that which represents his blood. And that to give it to be for the time of this remembrance, that which we would define as his suffering body and his shed blood for our sins. We know that this Savior Jesus was not rejected by us. How could they have called the man that Isaiah defined as wonderful counselor, and mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace? How could they have not have seen that? Moses referred to him as the seed of a woman. The star of Jacob, the scepter of Israel, the son of David, the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, the judge of Israel, the ruler in Israel. How could they not see that? When they searched for him as if he were a runaway criminal, when they put a price on his head, when they hunted for him as if he were an animal with such distaste, why could they not see that he was our high priest, our advocate, our intercessor, that he was the Christ, our righteousness, the mediator of the new covenant? He's the head of the church. He's a good shepherd, the light of the world, the true vine, the resurrection of life the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Why could they not have seen that? They heard the stories that he walked on the water, spoke to the wind and the waves, brought fish to the surface and they had the greatest catch of the century. Why could they not have seen this Jesus? Oh, they just didn't want to accept the fact that he was the son of God as he proclaimed. So much so that they wanted to charge him with blasphemy. And they thought if they flogged him enough, he would say, oh, I give. I'm not the son of God. Maybe they thought if they sped on him enough, they hit him enough and pulled his beard enough, shoved him enough and fed him less, that he would confess that he was not the son of God. But he could not make that confession because the truth of the matter is that he was. He is and always is the son of the true and the living God. Remember, he suffered. And I think about the day when there was an insurrection on our nation's capital. And I saw the rage and the behavior of the people that insisted on their way. Having things and bombarding aggression, bitterness and hatred and a thirst for blood. When I saw that, I couldn't help but think about my Savior Jesus. Surely it must have been a horrific scene. And that was merely a glimpse of what it must have been for our Savior Jesus Christ. The other thing I think about is that when Christ was taken in captivity, when he was arrested and prepared for execution, he was humble and peaceful. And he didn't cry or fuss or moan or groan. He responded as if a lamb. As a lamb that's led to the slaughter. This is actually an agricultural face, if you would. And it's based on the truth that a goat slaughtered in the traditional manner responds with blood curdling cries that can be heard a mile away. A goat makes a horrible noise when its, its life is being threatened. But a lamb 
submits to the butcher's knife silently. And the same phenomenon occurs when the animals are sheared. Jesus submitted to the outrages perpetrated against him, offering no more resistance than a lamb, either sheared or slaughtered. He was truly the spotless lamb of God. And he died for you and for me. He wants us to remember that he suffered. And when we come against opposition, when we have to flex some spiritual muscles against a, a place, a hard place, a place where we don't desire to be, may we think and look back on the love that God bestowed us through his son, Jesus Christ. He loved us. He loved us to life. Isn't that wonderful? Our second reading, basically, is to support this whole story. Coming in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 23 to 26, and again from the New Revised Standard Version is recorded. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, saying. In the same way, he took the cup and also after supper. And he says, As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. Surely if our Savior left, he's coming back. Wouldn't you think? If you don't believe it, it's so anyway. He's coming back. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And he says he's coming again. To gather us. It's a mystery, mind. It is a mystery. Some things that God reveals to us, other things are his to cherish as his mysteries. Some things we may not ever understand on this side. But we should purpose to realize that God sent his only begotten son. And we must believe this. We must believe with all our heart and soul that he sent him, that he might live that he might serve, that he might suffer, that he might die, that he might raise again, and that he might ascend to the Father. And most importantly, that he will return. That's what I'm looking forward to. Because when Christ raised up from the dead, the power that raised him up, raised me up and raised you up from the time you began to believe. He raised us up from the carnal that we were to the spiritual. He raised us up from the natural to the spiritual level. He gave us a new concept of thinking. He renewed our mind. Aren't we grateful? Aren't we grateful? May we cherish the memory. It's like there are times where he might have some things that we cherish in our lives, some things that are extremely dear to us. It may be a necklace given to us from our grandmother. It might be an heirloom of sorts. It might be an excellent piece of jewelry or furniture, whatever that item. It might be the first car that your father ever gave you. And you've maintained it and, and you keep it as a toy possession. If you cherish it, every now and then in life, we just bump into something that we cherish. Maybe we're pulling something out of the closet, something in the back of a drawer, something up in the attic. And all of a sudden, we're reminded of the love that was invested and that that item that we cherish so much that we barely even wear it. 
We just put it in the safe place. Every now and then we, we, we glance at it. And when we do, it brings back vivid memories of love and appreciation. And such is the case when we have Holy Communion. We have an opportunity to reflect on the story, the ancient story of old, of our Lord and Savior, and the gift, the precious gift he's given us of salvation. It is worth taking notice. It is worth telling the story. It is worth reenactment. It's worth being reminded. He loved us more than we could ever love ourselves. I thank you so much for joining us. When we think and remembering our Savior and his suffering, may we know that finally his meal is the one offered to all of humanity and connects bread and wine with the life and death of Jesus. It comes to individuals and it comes to communities alike in all times and places. As the word betrayed singles so clearly, the meal is offered to sinful creatures who are invited to both memory and hope for the human condition because of this suffering and this invitation from our Savior. I hope you enjoyed this message. I enjoyed giving it. To God be the glory. Hope to see you again real soon.